551 Mike Alpha, Sarasota Tower, runway 32, clear lane. Hello everyone and thanks for tuning in to this special edition of FS Mania. For the first time we're showcasing the recently released Microsoft Flight Simulator. Today we're in Sarasota, Florida, which by the way is where we ended our last video flying the X-Plane TBM 900 by Hot Start. Microsoft Flight Simulator has been out a few months now and I've spent more hours than I care to count getting familiar enough with the new simulator to create a decent video. In a few minutes, I'll share my thoughts and opinions on how well or poorly I think this brand new platform measures up for a state-of-the-art desktop flight simulator. For our inaugural MSFS flight, I selected the Daher TBM 930. I think it'll be interesting to compare this MSFS default TBM 930 with the X-Plane payware version of the TBM 900. I've planned a short cross-country flight to the subtropical paradise of Key West, Florida. Located closer to Cuba than to Miami, Key West is a unique confluence of history, climate, natural beauty, cultural diversity, architecture, and romantic appeal. The city's motto is, close to perfect, far from normal. The TBM 900 series holds the distinction of being the fastest single engine production airplane in existence. At max power, the TBM 930 burns only 60 gallons an hour. Not bad at all for an airplane that's near the performance of many light jets. The TBM 930 is equipped with the Garmin G3000 avionics suite. The G3000 system is a big improvement over the G1000 thanks to its integrated touchscreens, which permit the pilot to perform nearly all interactions with the system on its smart and shallow menu architecture. The package includes three high-resolution flight displays, which are not touchscreens. Synthetic vision is standard. Below the flight displays are the two Garmin GTC 580 touch controllers. The TBM 900 has a seating capacity for up to six people, including the pilot, and a maximum payload of 1,400 pounds. She is 35 feet long, 14 feet high, and has a wingspan of 42 feet. The Pratt & Whitney PT6A-66D turboprop engine fitted with a five-blade Hartzell constant speed propeller is rated at 850 shaft horsepower. Maximum cruise speed is 330 knots, service ceiling is 31,000 feet. The price for the TBM 930 is slightly north of 4 million US dollars. Fun fact, for the 2020 TBM 940 model, Daher has introduced several upgrades that include auto throttle, automatic de-icing, and home safe, which is an emergency system that automatically brings the airplane to a runway touchdown if the pilot becomes incapacitated. I say let's put the 940 on our payware wish list. Alrighty then, I'll leave it there. Climb aboard, buckle up, let's fly to Key West. And a very good afternoon to you. Welcome aboard. This is FS Mania's nonstop flight from Sarasota to Key West, Florida. Our flight planned route is 211 nautical miles with an estimated time in route of 47 minutes. Weather along our route is VFR with only a few scattered clouds, light and variable winds. Looks like a great day to fly, so just sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. Let's get our pushback going and get the show on the road. Shift P will wake up our guy there, and he'll come over here, and while he's on his way, let's get our battery on and our generator on and then we'll cut on our strobes let everybody know that we're getting ready for startup our garments are firing up we'll accept that and get our pushback since this is a default aircraft and several of the systems are not accurately modeled I'm gonna do an abbreviated startup if you want to see a full startup procedure be sure to check out the FS mania X-Plane Hot Start TBM 900 video on the FS Mania channel. I do have a couple of mods installed that enhance this TBM's performance as well as the functionality of the Garmin uh, G3000 and I'll be sure to include links for both those mods in the video description. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm not going to use ATC for this flight. We'll keep them tuned in but 
I've already received a special clearance for the entire route, so we own the sky in this video. All right, I think that's good. I appreciate it. And parking brake set. Clear the, okay. Thank you. Clear the caution. And let's get up here and check everything. Okay, we've got our strobe on. Basically, all we need to do now to get this thing started is get our boost pump in the on position. Get our starter going. And come down and watch for 12% NG. And when we get that, add some fuel. There's 50%. Bring it on up into flight idle and that's a good start. Now we can come back up here, kill our strobes, bring our nav lights on. We'll cut on some panel lights. We've got our generator on. Um, starters in off, ignitions auto, auxiliary boost pump. Let's go to auto, autopilot and trims are on and we'll need some oxygen since we're gonna be above 10,000. And I think we're good up there. Over here, we'll cut on this inert sep for taxi and take off add a little bit of air conditioning let's get our bleeds up into the auto position check our cast messages just what we should have and let's come down and get our pfd and mfd set up and our radio so we're going to put the nav source to fms since we'll be using the gps speed bugs we'll put those um, let's see, not all on, I just want the rotate and the approach speed, 90 and 85 respectively. Go back and uh, the inert steps on, thank you very much. Kill that caution. MFD, let's get our flight plan plugged in. So we are in Sarasota, so put that in and we're going to key west so let's put that in and we're going to put in some in route waypoints um i want to show you how to do this on four flight real quick too as well let me finish here um in fact actually let's do that um go ahead and show you how to put this into four flights I use four flight a lot when I'm doing um, when I'm flight simming so I'm going to bring up our flight plan and just type in our departure which is Sarasota uh, it's SRQ hit the space bar we've got Sarasota in there and I'm going to type in the waypoints that I know that we're going to use. I'll show you how to get those later. Uh, so there's Sabi and then Carter as our next waypoint. And Carnu and then Key West. So we close that and you can look here and see there's our route of flight so it'll take us a little bit off of the um, off of the uh, Gulf Coast um, here's the Everglades down in here so we'll um, come out here and that'll line us up to go into runway 27 real nice we're going to use a GPS approach into runway 27 I'll add that later and um, just for information purposes I'll show you if you want to um, look at routes you click that little button right there and you can see all the different routes that have been cleared by ATC and when and 
uh, how high and all of that information is right there. So handy little tool. You can't beat for, for flight for uh, a, a cockpit companion in my opinion. And uh, it's really not very expensive. There's an annual subscription fee, but it's not that much. So let's go back down and finish putting in our um, waypoint. So we said Sabi was the next. Echo, echo, enter that. And we're gonna do another one, and that was Carter. Enter that, and one more car new. November uniform. Enter that, and I'll tell it that we're done. Let's go back and take a look. Everything looks good there. Let's zoom out uh, enough to see that the route looks reasonable. It does to me. So we can zoom back in. And let's come back then to our NAVCOM. We'll put in a squawk code. And it is on out. It should be standby and go to out when we uh, altitude when we take off. It's not going to do that. That's okay. It's not modeled 100%. There's several things that aren't modeled 100%, and we're going to live with those. This is is a default aircraft. So I'm going to be sharing some of my thoughts about um, MFSF. MFSF. Microsoft MSFS Microsoft Flight Simulator and uh, as we get up and uh, underway later so at any rate um, let's see before taxi we want to do a check of our flight controls um, the inert set we've cut on and so basically we can get, get our taxi light on and get out of here. Nav lights on, taxi light comes on, park and brake. Let's don't forget to release it. It's released. Clear left. Clear right. Off we go. Just a short taxi out here to our uh, departure runway, runway 32. We're going to take an intersection departure, but we will have 8,000 feet of runway, which is more than enough. Approaching runway 32. Thank you for flight. I'll bring her back up and um, get it ready for departure. So we'll close our flight plan and we're going to go with track up and I'll zoom us in a little bit uh, so we can see Sabi. And right now our track's not up because we're not moving, but it will come up. So that's where I want that. And I think we're okay right there and let's cut on our pedo heat and our stall warning heats over there flaps 10 degrees set and indicating our um, toga we'll put that on so we'll get a flight director and cast messages we've got inert set that's it we'll cut on our cut on our uh, strobe light, we'll cut on our, cut off the taxi, we'll cut on the pulse lights, and we're ready to go. Nothing coming from the left, nothing coming from the right. Away we go. Oh, one thing I forgot to do, let's do this real fast. We'll set an altitude in here, and I will say that 
uh, for some reason this out select only is in hundreds so it takes a bit of time so it's not something you want to forget uh, to, to get it dialed up to your uh, altitude normally we would not get cleared to 11,000 feet but that's what we're putting in since we can do what we want and on our heading um, we're showing about a 140 for our departure so um, we're taking off actually in the opposite way um, I think I'll bring us around to oops hit the wrong thing the barrow let's push it and go back because it's standard um, let's go the other way and we're going to turn to a heading of 240 and get us going in the right direction so now we can get out of here approaching runway 32 generally in the right direction and we'll speed up our forward speed to about 160. Okay, everything's set. That's, that's the way I like it. And when we get uh, close to coming, getting on course, we'll uh, go into the nav mode and we'll call that a good departure. Look at four flight. We're still in the turn a little bit, but we'll intercept this course outbound and then, we'll get, like I say, we'll go in the nav mode. You can see it here as well. Uh, I just like four flight. I can also change the, um, the map to um, layer to B rather than VFR. Uh, I can put in the IFR map right there and also put in that's the low um, chart it's not a map it's a chart and that's the high chart right there so we change those layers there's so much you can do with four flight um, I really uh, they do not sponsor me no one sponsors me but um, I 
will say I have used it a lot in real world and simulation flying and it's it's pretty dang nice. Let's go back to VFR. Since we're flying VFR today. Okay. Coming through 8,000 feet. All is up well with the world. Beautiful day, a few clouds. Hopefully, and uh, some of those will clear off before we get to Key West, so that we can see an amazing sunset when we get there. It's coming through 10,000 feet. Let's ditch our pulse light, and we should have already done this. Better late than never. Cut off our inert set, and really have to pay attention to the torque because it climbs rapidly. It takes about 40 or 50 seconds for the inert set to retract and uh, I think in this particular model it uh, they over exaggerate the, uh, how much increase there is in the torque. So you just have to really pay attention to it for the better part of a, a minute and uh, wait for it to stabilize leveling off now at 11,000 and let's get on our nav mode we are just about to intercept our course 95% on the torque and it looks like it's about stable our airspeed's climbing our ground speed right now is 250 and four flight agrees with that 255 knots, 18 miles to Sabi, 185 nautical miles from Key West, so good stuff. Everything looks lovely. Torque seems to have stabilized about 94% here at 11,000 feet, and uh, I chose one 1,000 so I didn't have to worry about breaking the 250 knot speed limit below 10,000 and seemed like a good plan to me. Okay, so <laughs> looks like everything's set up the way I want it. And while we're uh, in the first part of our cruise, uh, Let's just chat a few minutes about um, Microsoft Flight Simulator and I'll share uh, my thoughts on it and keep in mind this is my opinion for what it's worth but um, there was a lot of media hype about uh, the simulator and a lot of buzz in the community and after all of that I pretty much expected the newly launched uh, MFS, MSFS to be the holy grail of desktop flight simulation and now that I've had a few months to get to know MSFS I realize the need to lower my expectations of what could be actually uh, and accurately simulated on a hundred dollar consumer grade desktop flight simulator and while it may not be the holy grail the simulator is pretty dang impressive especially when you consider where we started and I should know because I was there I began primary flight training back in 1978 at a time when there was no such thing as a desktop flight simulation. Microsoft Flight Simulator 1 was introduced in 1982 and somehow I managed to score a copy of FS1 which amounted to one five and a quarter inch floppy disk on an IBM XT running MS-DOS with a monochrome monitor. To say the ensuing 38 years we've come a mighty long way would be an understatement. And while much of that progress is due to the development by Microsoft, don't forget, in 2006, if memory serves, Microsoft fired the FSX ACES team and left the flight simulation community to pretty much fend for itself, which we have done, thanks in large part to a lot of very talented and dedicated individuals in the AvSim and FlightSim forums. 
For 14 years, those folks provided support and tweaks to FSX that kept it alive until Microsoft decided to return. Hopefully this time, they'll hang around long enough to see it through, but who knows? I'm sure it will depend largely on profitability. And at the end of the day, business is business. We're in the turn now headed towards Carter. At any rate, currently, Microsoft still has the longest running flight simulator franchise in history. And they're probably one of the few companies able and willing to take the take on the task of recreating a very complex scenery of the whole world. I mean, we're talking tons of data that would easily fill up over a million DVDs. I think it should be noted, MSFS is still a work in progress and probably will be for a long time. Compared to FSX, P3D, and X-Plane, this new kid on the block is a very young simulator. Still in the early days, Asobo has released several updates to address numerous issues that have been reported. And personally, I have spent more hours than I care to count in user forums trying to solve a long list of issues. Those range from getting the pesky tooltips and twitchy controls corrected to the dreaded CTD, aka crash to desktop. Fortunately, so far, I've been able to find solutions to most of my issues. A lot of complaints I've read in the forums are directed towards the various aircraft which are included in, with the simulator software. And it's true, these aircraft are not fully functional and the avionics are dumbed down, which is what I'm used to seeing with any simulator's default aircraft. In my opinion, the Microsoft flight simulator default aircraft are arguably as good or as bad as any other simulator's default aircraft. I think we can agree that this vanilla out-of-the-box version has raised the bar for flight simulation. Really, I see very little need to install a multitude of software add-ons that FSX and P3D and X-Plane require to get the simulator looking more realistic. And the problem with needing all those add-ons or plug-ins is that many of the issues simmers have are caused by conflicts between add-ons. With what I saw in the pre-release videos, it didn't look like add-on developers would have much they could offer to improve the simulator. But now that I've spent time exploring the, MF, the MSFS world, I can see plenty of areas that need to be improved in terms of accuracy, realism, including airports and taxiways and signage and parking, etc. So I'm not saying that to run down a Sobo because I think it would be unrealistic to think anyone can create, recreate the entire planet without making errors. Add-on scenery developers can focus on areas much smaller than the Earth, like airports or cities, and offer a more accurately detailed version of those areas for purchase. And I believe Orbix is already doing that and has done it and I've seen some, some really nice examples. I was going to say that um, currently uh, this simulator, MSFS, has minimal add-ons available for purchase. Uh, there are a number, of, a number of mods available that attempt to make the default aircraft and the avionics more realistic. High-quality, study-level aircraft take time to develop for sure, but they will come, and we just need to be patient. With all that said, I'll say this, I would not write X-Plane off by any stretch. X-Plane is a mature simulation platform, and by that I mean it's stable, and it has a multitude of highly developed, study-level aircraft available. With the introduction of Vulcan in X-Plane 11.5, I believe X-Plane will be able to ratchet up their graphics and hopefully their weather depiction to a level 
on par with MSFS. Now, MSFS is by no means perfect. Flight simulation isn't perfect. Aviation isn't perfect. There are glitches in the real world of flying and on the simulator, and they have to be dealt with both in the air and on the ground. Microsoft Simulator is a fresh, modern platform with tons of potential to improve by further refinement and development. We will probably always have to do some tinkering to software with the complexity of a flight simulator that puts the entire globe at our fingertips. But as for me, I'm pretty pleased when I can fly the vanilla envelope default version of a simulator and have it look and perform on a level never seen before in desktop consumer grade flight simulation. So that's my two cents for what it's worth. And let's pay attention to where we are and where we're going. Bring up four flight again. And everything I get right here, I can get over here. But the print is a little bit small. And I really need to zoom in tight uh, to be able to read any of this stuff here. It's almost dumb. Um, I don't know why it's so small, but it is is—it is that small, and it's hard to read, and it's clear, but it's just hard to read. But I can easily read that it's 65 nautical miles to Carter, and it is 131 nautical miles to Key West. We're cruising ground speed of 278 knots. The TBM will go faster at higher altitudes. But this is a short flight. We're going to be there in two shakes. I'm going to cut the cameras off right now and I will cut them back on as we prepare for the descent so I'll see you guys in a few. Next time on FS Mania. Be sure to tune in to part two of this flight as we descend from our cruise altitude fly GPS approach, and land in picturesque Key West just in time to catch a spectacular sunset. Until then, from FS Mania, so long. Number 0 Contact Miami Center 134.75.